So we're talking Gear VR optimization. And something that I'm working on right now that uh, it has a lot of potential and that I, I'm very close to getting it working on the gear. I've got it working on Unity on the, on the desktop, but, but not on the gear to an Android bug, but I'm gonna get through that, is a combination stereoscopic, monoscopic camera rig based upon culling layers. So the idea is that, uh, for instance, for the game that I'm working on, Zone, I was pushing about 45 frames per second full stereo with everything I wanted in it. And it was nice because, because with time warp, with time warp, the way that it works, even 45 is okay, but 60 is way, way better. You want to be hitting 60. And so uh, one night I said, you know what? I'm just going to have some fun here. And even though I know this is going to be just awful, I'm going to render it monoscopically altogether. Did it, passed it around to my group of five or six friends that are also my closest play testers. All of them preferred the monoscopic experience. And I said, oh, they're probably just seeing the 60 frames per second and, that, and they're subconsciously feeling that's better. And they say, no, 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 this is easier on the eyes. And I said, what is going on here? So I go upstairs and I back to back rendered a stereoscopic version. And immediately when I put it on, I noticed something I never noticed until I had seen the monoscopic one. And that is that my eye muscles felt strained because of all of the divergence necessary as every saccade, I'm going from point to point to point to point to point, and I'm changing my depth, it was tiring on the eyes. I thought, you know what? The stereo is really, really cool, but this mono feels better, but I really like the stereo for certain things. So I said, well, what if I can selectively render things in stereo, not just to, uh, not just for performance reasons, but actually for artistic reasons. The idea being that if you can pin certain things at the infinite plane, essentially by rendering them monoscopic, like the outside world, and then you can layer on top of it things that are rendered stereoscopy, stereo, stereoscopically, the stereo effect will be very notable. And so here's what I basically want to come up with, is I figured out how to mount a, a third camera in between the two cameras of the stereo rig. And so that camera renders to a texture. And that camera only sees things in the world. Everything basically, but in my game, it's like a, it's a rail shooter where it's like a Star Fox kind of game where you're, where you're flying. And so you have a cockpit and a HUD. And so the idea is I want my cockpit and the heads up display elements, like the spinning pentagons that, that fly out into the world to lock onto targets, stereo, everything else mono. So what I do is I render that mono camera view to a texture, and then I put quads in front of the two stereo cameras, called so the left one only sees one quad, the right one sees the one the other quad, and just set those quads to show that render texture. Yeah. So you've got this basically this composited map moving around of monoscopic imagery with only a couple layers rendering in stereo. It's like the early days of film, that there's all there's things that need to be learned that work and that don't work, like with the early days of film. And I think this is a big one, that, that it's not necessarily ideal to have full stereoscopy all the time in all experiences. It's like, it, that's like a crescendo, it's sort of. It's like and That's actually why we shoot in mono at Tolson at 360, is because we did like some testing and like had people try on, because they get nauseous very quickly, they get strained very yeah. easily. Well, also the the, images don't the stereo, if you don't have motion parallax, yeah. You get conflicting views. Exactly. Yes. So it's just much easier on the eyes to watch a stare a single mono. It's actually image. worse for you guys because you're not simulating a moving viewpoint. Exactly. It's yeah. easily simulating a moving viewpoint. So, yeah. And you got all the parallax yeah. as you move through the scene, which yeah. helps sell so, the 3D. So one thing I, 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 I sort of feel compelled to mention at this point because it goes along with everything you're saying is if you remember um, uh, Martin Scorsese's uh, Yugo from several years ago, where he tried his hand at a stereo feature film. I don't know if yes, you saw I do, it. of course. And um, I noticed the second time I saw it, mm -hmm. um, I that there were a, quite a few shots that were absolutely totally mono. Mm -hmm. And so, it, so every time he wants to focus your attention on a specific thing in the scene, he drops back to mono and he uses uh, depth effects. Mm -hmm. So you have to watch this character. You have no choice. And then there's a cutaway. And then he goes back again, and now you see it in stereo, the same character in stereo, with the background behind them, so your eyes are yes, explored. Yes, I recall that. He's like grabs your attention with storytelling, and yes. says, I know that this is going to work in the stereo. I don't want them looking over there. Yes. Mm -hmm. So now, if I, now I have these floating opponents out there, 30 meters away, that are in mono, but when I spin a lock-on target out into the world, that's stereo. Yeah. And so it pops yeah. over the mono. So that's just an example of a, of a technique that's really, really important. Very cool. Um, so I've got this game called Zone, 
and it's very procedurally generated in that it's a it's a it's a rail shooter that's an infinite world but the positions of objects in the world change each time so I'm dynamically placing lots of the same object all over so if there's an obstacle there'll be like 10 obstacles or 20 obstacles 20 of the same obstacle and for me make it the make it or break it feature that enabled me to get this working on the Gear VR any idea what it might be dynamic batching do you know about dynamic batching Okay, this, it, I could not do zone without dynamic batching. Unity has batching features in it. You know, are we all familiar with draw calls, what that is? You're a little, okay, here's the basic idea. In, in Unity, if you look at the profiler, you've got two main metrics that will determine uh, how, how loaded your scene is. One is your, your number of vertices that are being drawn at any given time on the screen, number of triangles that are being drawn, but there's another very, very important one, and that is the number of draw calls. The way that I explain draw calls to non-technical people, it's like a, a draw call is like shaking the Etch-a-Sketch. So you got an Etch-a-Sketch, you draw it, right? And then you want to do another layer, you got to shake it to clear it, to, to draw something else, and that's very expensive, it's very time consuming. So on the Gear VR, you, can not, you cannot have more than 100 draw calls or your frame rate will drop. And uh, generally, I, would like to, I like to keep my draw calls closer to 50, 50 to 80 draw calls. And so if I have a thing, just this, uh, let's say a, a, an obstacle that I want to put out, a tree, and I want to put 30 of them into the world, and I just do it naively, that's 30 draw calls. And I've just used up a huge amount of my budget. But there is a technique in Unity called dynamic batching that allows you, if, if you, your meshes meet certain criteria, and there's about six criteria for your meshes and materials to meet, that it will automatically batch them into a single draw call. So by just by modifying my meshes a little bit, I was able to go from 30 draw calls to one draw call. For those so trees, like you're not blowing your fragment shader budget or something. Or no, it's not fragment shader budget at this point. It's a couple things. It's um, that's different. This is CP we're talking, not oh, GP. CP. Oh, okay. This before is CP. It never gets to this GP. is before it gets to the GPU. And so on the, the on the so the basic criteria are your meshes cannot have more than 300 points, and it's not actually 300 points. They cannot have more than 900 vertex attributes. Because every vertex has three attributes. It has the point, it has the normal, and it has the tangent. So essentially it's 300. And, and so if your mesh has 301 vertices, you're going to have 30 draw calls. If it has 299, you can have one draw call. Huge. And there are ways in certain... You can split up your objects. You, you, well, what do you mean? I mean, if I have something with two, I can split it up into two different objects. That's actually an interesting idea. Like, could you split it into two objects with 250 points rather than one with 500? Yeah. Yes, you actually can do that. Okay. Now, James. hey, I'm James. Hey. And so there is another technique in Unity called static batching, which might apply to the kind of thing you're doing here. Because I, if you're, this, he's explaining to us all of the tricks he's learned in the course of making his game that runs on that thing, how to make Unity go like much, much faster. Yeah. I've got a, and oh, there's another trick without it overheating after five minutes. Well, that's good. Because, you know, a lot, a lot of games overheat. This game that I've got on here, Zone, I have confirmation from people that they can run the whole battery down for three hours and never, will never overheat. And it's, it's make or break. So dynamic batching, that's a big one. You, there's also a way to, uh, there's ways to static batch things and, or to combine your meshes beforehand if you know where they're going to be and if they don't move. But most things in most compelling experiences move. And so you've got to get this dynamic, dynamic batching going. So make your scene out of simple elements. And there's some, there's some other real gotchas that I found there. For example, when importing, I, the way that I, my workflow is I model in Cinema 4D, whether it be Maya or Max or anything, same basic idea. I'm modeling in a modeling program, and I'm importing into Unity. And so I assume that when I model, and I put a certain number of vertices on my models, that that's what I'm going to get in Unity. It does not work like that at all. Unity will add vertices, and it will sometimes add a lot of vertices depending upon things like your fong angle <laughs> that you've got, depending upon the smoothing angle on your, on your, your fong, uh, it will add more or less vertices. So for example, I thought I was going to be really clever and go for a real low poly look. You know, do you know what I'm talking about here? That in meshes, there's smoothing on it, and there's this real popular kind of look, the low poly look. So I thought, I'm going to go as low poly as possible. And then and add it add vertices all over. Because Unity, when there's, when there's less than a 60 degree angle between, at, at the intersection, it has to 
to two points for every one point. So it was making my 300 point meshes up to 600 point meshes, thus breaking dynamic batching. And so there's all these little gotchas that you just have to, the way that I did it is I just started from like a blank canvas. If you're 61 degrees, you're okay? Yes. Well, yeah, something like that. It won't, it won't duplicate. Now, you can actually tell after you've imported into Unity, you can open up your mesh and look and see how many points you finally have. But just knowing to look there, I never thought to look there because I assumed it was the same as I would import. It's not. So you have to look at your, all your meshes there. And then you'll know you've got it working because your profiler will say, here's how many calls you're saving due to dynamic batching. Another big one, another, another big one, and, and this, this is more for uh, getting a really cool look without, um, without overheating the device. I'm using image-based lighting. Everyone knows what image-based lighting is, right? HDR, image-based lighting. So I'm using a plugin for Unity called SkyShop. Have you seen this? No. Okay. So the shaders that I'm using are particular shaders from this particular add-on called SkyShop. And they're all based upon pre-calculated convoluted light maps for diffuse and specular. So rather than my, let's say I wanted to get a, a, some cool look beyond the standard out of the box Unity look, I might think I'm going to write a fancy shader. That will kill the Gear VR a lot of times because if you're the Gear VR is actually really good at pulling in textures. And you yes, yeah. it's very good at that, and it's yeah. so good at that 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 I've got this thing that you got you'll you'll see this. It looks really really cool because I'm using image based lighting with all sorts of uh, different lighting environments. I mean, it's it's yeah. basically like the RTHR DVL demo a long time ago. You know that kind of lighting. That's this is the reason my software Java renderer was able to work at all. Because I just pre-compute. Pre-compute. Yeah. So there, therein lies the a sort of abstraction of the principle. Pre-compute when you can everything. It's like classic ideas from the demo scene. Everyone knows the demo scene back in the day, right? Yeah. You'd have to pre-compute your sign tables, <laughs> you know, back then. Now you pre-compute your lighting. Pre-compute your lighting. And I didn't even think of that as a really big deal until people are telling me how all of their Gear VR apps can't run for more than 20 minutes without overheating. This can run for two, three hours because it's just doing lookups into tables to do all the lighting. And so my GPU and the profiler is low, low. It's not, it's not loaded. It's not doing these massive pipelines. Right. So I really recommend using that lighting. Um, it's not dynamic lighting because it's pre-computed. Well, but we could also do several of them probably and layer them like we were doing in the fog. Absolutely. You know, much more interesting things. You can, even, you can even, for example, one thing I haven't done yet, but I, I want to experiment with it and do it, you could do... This uh, Sky Shop supports blending from one lighting environment to another. So you can cross fade from one lighting environment to another. So you could, for instance, open up V-Ray and render out a complete day-night cycle as like 16 different spheres, and then just go from one to the other and have complete day-night. Yeah, and so you know, with the, with, the, with the people in this room, we could actually basically implement that ourselves, too. Yes. Because we know <laughs> what you're saying makes perfect sense. Absolutely, absolutely. My suspicion is that uh, it's the GPU that's getting hot mm -hmm. on there. And that, surprisingly, this kind of lighting, even though I've got all this you know, fancy specularity and cube mapping and all that, it's not hard work for the GPU to do all that. What is hard work for the GPU to do is if you're going to, like, if you're going to calculate things, like, even if you're just going to write, like, a, a, you know, a Lambert shader or half Lambert or something, you're doing, you're just doing a lot of, you know, calculations of dot products and all that kind of math. That's, that's doing something other than saying, give me the, the point from this UV in this lookup. That's easy. But a lot of times there, there's things that are, there, where there's loops and there's just there's work to be done that gets the GPU hot. Also, if the GPU, if the CPU, so you think it's the GPU. I think that that's the culprit. And that, that's why I'm the only, I mean, people are, when I'm posting on Reddit, people are saying there's no way that's going to run more than 10 minutes. I'm saying, what are you guys talking about? This runs for two, three hours on this with no problem. And that's the only thing I can think that's different because... I'm, I have a moderate amount of draw calls and vertices, but I'm the only one that I know that's using this kind of lighting, this kind of all pre-computed lighting. I've got, I don't have any directional lights in my scene. Nothing. There's no lights. It's all textures. It's all textures. And, yeah. and it's, it, yeah. Now, sometimes uh, on the desktop version, I like to in integrate. One really cool technique to do is when you're using image-based lighting like this, for instance here, we've got the sun. Right? You can line up a directional light with the sun to give you shadows and all that that look like they really are integrated with that image based lighting environment. But that's a feature I just took out of the Gear VR version and I don't really miss it that much. And I think it's partly why I can run for so long cold. Right? Yeah. 
batch as much as you can, pre-compute everything, particularly with lighting, and get the draw calls down, rely upon simple, simple geometry, figure out how to create the experience you want to create with meshes that are under 300 point vertices. It's like an interesting constraint. Uh, so the one thing you said before you came in, which is crucial, is that if you have more, fewer than like 900 numbers, so it's basically 300 vertices, because it's XYZ plus normal plus the texture stuff, um, then as long as you're within that budget, mm -hmm. Unity on this thing will batch together things into a single draw call. Yes. Um, so you don't waste your draw call budgets. And yes. That, but you have to be careful. With, that's why he was saying, like, you, you actually, if it adds more vertices, you're screwed. So you can split up your objects. You can use simpler things with the texture there, blah, blah, blah. But then it's much, much faster. Got it. Okay. Much faster.